Hi there, this interview is a short, quick review of some companies on our watch list. We hope these are starting places for your research into what companies would make a good passive income portfolio for you. Some of these we own and some we just have on our list. Let us know in the comments if you like anyone in particular. It's always blue Saturday, wherever I am. All right, so let's uh, let's dive into some articles today on dividend investing. You're looking to build some passive income and you want to steer clear of certain sectors. Okay. Like cigarettes uh, and even pharma makes you a little hesitant. Yeah, I can understand that. Totally. Yeah. Um, but we got some interesting articles here. And uh, have you ever heard of dividend aristocrats, kings, and contenders? Yeah, those are great. Um, and that's a great place to start because they have a proven track record. They don't just pay dividends. They consistently increase them over time. Oh, okay. Interesting. So we're talking at least 25 years for aristocrats, uh, a whopping 50 plus years for kings. Wow. And then at least 10 years for contenders. Okay, so these are companies that are committed to sharing their profits with investors year after year. Exactly. So it sounds like a pretty solid foundation for passive income. Yeah, and consistency is key here. You know, a super high dividend yield might seem tempting. Yeah. But it can actually be a red flag. Yeah, think of it this way. If a company is desperately offering a huge yield, it could be a sign of trouble. Almost like they're trying to lure you in with this flashy number. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I'd rather focus on stability and long-term growth than chase, you know, a quick buck that might disappear tomorrow. That's the smart approach. Okay, cool. One of the articles that we have, My Single Biggest Regret as an Investor by Samuel Smith, really dives into these different types of investments and how understanding these can help you avoid costly mistakes. Well, it's your, what kind of mistakes? Well, he talks about three main categories growth slash innovative companies, okay. stalwart income stocks, and cyclical stocks. Huh? And um, he admits that his biggest regret was getting caught up in the hype surrounding growth companies like Palantir, Tesla, and Meta. I get that. Uh -huh. Yeah, those companies can be so exciting to follow, but the valuations can be all over the place. Yeah, and how do you even know when to buy or sell? And that's exactly his point. It's incredibly difficult to time the market with those types of companies. Mm. Buy and hold might be a more sensible approach, but even then it's a gamble. So where do these stalwart NKIF stocks fit in? That's a great question. These are the companies that he believes are much better suited for this dividend focused strategy. Um, so think companies like Realty Income and Ares Capital. They're typically profitable, have a history of stability, and often use a capital recycling strategy. Capital recycling. I like that. Break that down for me. Yeah. So you buy the stock at a good price. Okay. You hold it, collect those sweet dividends, and then when the valuation gets high enough, you sell a portion of your holdings and reinvest the proceeds. Interesting. It's like a dividend-powered growth engine. Yeah. I like the sound of that. It seems like a much more... Uh, controlled and predictable approach compared to the wild ride of these growth companies. Exactly. What about that last category, the uh, the cyclical stocks? Ah, uh, yes. That's like the roller coaster ride of investing. Okay. And he uses gold mining companies as an example. Okay. Um, you know, these companies are heavily influenced by economic cycles. Their stock prices can be extremely volatile. Right. So timing is everything with these. You need strong nerves and a deep understanding of that specific industry. Sounds like you could get burned if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So focusing on those stalwart income stocks, especially the dividend aristocrats, kings, and contenders. Right. That seems like a safer bet for building long-term passive income. Precisely. And you know, to see the strategy in action, we have another article here, Dividend Harvesting Portfolio. Mm -hmm. This author shares their personal journey of building a dividend-focused portfolio starting in 2022. Oh, wow. With a projected annual income of just over $500. Get this, their projected dividends for this year have already jumped to almost $1,850. Wow, that is some serious growth. What's their secret? Do they load up on those high-yield risky stocks that you warned me about? Not at all. The author emphasizes diversification and risk mitigation by spreading the investments across different sectors, mm -hmm. equities, ETFs, CEFs, REITs, and BDCs. They're not putting all their eggs in one basket. Okay, hold on. I'm getting lost in the acronyms. Yeah. What are CEFs and BDCs again? Oh, good point. CEFs are closed end funds, okay. which are like mutual funds, but with a fixed number of shares that are traded on an exchange. Got it. 
BDCs are business development companies. Right. And these invest in small and mid-sized businesses, often providing loans and equity investments. Oh, interesting. Both can offer higher yields than traditional stocks, but also come with their own sets of risks. Got it. So this dividend harvesting author, they're casting a wide net, spreading the risk around and still seeing those impressive returns. Exactly. What else stood out to you about their approach? Well, they shared an anecdote about how they're already generating over $30 per week in dividend income. Wow. And they're on track to exceed $35 per week next year. That's awesome. It's like building your own personal paycheck powered by the companies you believe in. That's a powerful image. Yeah. Yeah, it really drives home the point that dividend investing can be a way to generate that consistent stream of income. Exactly. Almost like creating your own financial safety net. Yeah. And what I find particularly insightful is the author's really bullish outlook for 2025. And they cite potential policy changes under the new Trump administration as a key driver for their optimism. What kind of policy changes are we talking about? So things like lower corporate taxes, okay, less regulation in energy markets. Oh, interesting. And even the possibility of lower interest rates, all factors that could potentially create a more favorable environment for businesses and their ability to pay and even increase dividends. So it's not just about picking the right companies. It's also right. about understanding the bigger picture of the economic and political landscape. Absolutely. The author seems to be betting on this business-friendly environment okay. that will boost corporate profits and ultimately benefit dividend investors. It's a calculated risk, of course, but one they seem confident in. I'm starting to see the appeal of this whole dividend investing approach, especially for someone like me who's looking for stability and wants to avoid that volatility of those high-growth, high-risk companies. It definitely sounds like a strategy worth exploring further. Mm -hmm. And to help you understand why dividends can be such a powerful tool for building wealth, we have another article here, Wall Street, We Have a Problem That Dividends Can Fix, by Leo Nillison. Okay, I'm intrigued. What kind of problem? He paints a somewhat sobering picture of the current market landscape. He's pointing out that valuations are historically high right now, and this could lead to lower returns for investors in the coming years, especially those chasing those high-flying growth stocks. So a party might be coming to an end. It's a possibility and one that investors need to be aware of. But here's where dividends come in. He argues that they can act as a kind of safety net in this potentially volatile environment. I'm listening. Tell me more. He brings up a fascinating concept called S&P 500 excess yield. And it's basically the difference between stock yields and bond yields. Right. And guess what? It's at a multi-year low right now. Oh, wow. Making stocks relatively less attractive compared to bonds. Interesting. So you're saying bonds are looking more appealing than stocks in terms of yield. Yeah. What does that mean for dividend investors? That's a great question. So he believes this scenario might lead to uh, rotation into dividend stocks, okay. potentially pushing their valuations higher. Think about it. When growth becomes uncertain, that steady income stream from dividends starts to look a lot more attractive. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. People flock to dividends for safety and stability, yeah. driving up the prices of those dividend paying companies. Exactly, and that's why he's advocating for buying now. While these companies are still relatively undervalued. Interesting. He even quotes T. Rowe Price, a respected investment firm. He says, it's not about chasing the cheapest or highest yielding stocks, but rather seeking those compellingly valued names relative to their long-term prospects. Okay, so we're not just looking for any company that pays a dividend. We're looking for quality. Right stability, and a reasonable price. Basically the holy grail of investing. You got it. And that brings us back to those dividend aristocrats, kings, and contenders. Right. They've proven their ability to weather economic storms. They have a history of consistent dividend growth. And many of them are in sectors that are essential to our daily lives. Things like consumer staples, healthcare, and energy. This is all starting to make a lot of sense. But with so many companies to choose from, where do we even begin? That's a great question, and one we'll explore in more detail as we continue this deep dive. Okay. Hi there. Sorry to break in, but we have to ask if you'd please subscribe and like the channel. It helps us a lot. Back to the interview. Let's start by taking a closer look at some specific examples. Okay. From Morningstar's list of the 10 best dividend stocks. Okay. They've done a lot of the legwork for us, identifying companies with strong fundamentals and attractive dividend yields. Awesome. Lead the way. I'm eager to see what they've uncovered. Mm, great. Let's start with a true titan of industry, ExxonMobil. 
ExxonMobil, a classic dividend king. They've been increasing their dividend for over 50 years. Wow. Morningstar gives them a narrow economic moat rating, and their current dividend yield sits at a respectable 3.3%. Okay. I'm familiar with ExxonMobil, but what does a narrow economic moat mean exactly? It's a way of assessing a company's competitive advantage, you know, and its ability to fend off rivals and maintain profitability over the long term. Okay. A narrow moat suggests they have a decent advantage, but may face some challenges down the road in ExxonMobil's case. It's interesting to note that they're sticking with their commitment to oil and gas, even with all the talk about renewables these days. Right. It's a bold move, and some investors see it as a risk, while others admire their conviction. Yeah, it's definitely a conversation starter. I can see how that kind of long-term strategy could appeal to dividend investors who prioritize stability and predictability. Exactly. And speaking of long-term strategies, let's move on to another energy giant on Morningstar's list. Chevron, they're a dividend aristocrat with a healthy 4.18% yield. Chevron, another familiar name. They're known for their dividend payments, right? Yep. What's their outlook like? Morningstar considers them a good buy, even with some uncertainty surrounding their planned acquisition of Hess. Oh, okay. There's some arbitration going on that's pushed the deal's closure to 2025. But even without the acquisition, Chevron seems to be in a strong position. It's interesting that both ExxonMobil and Chevron are energy companies. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why this sector tends to be so dividend friendly? It's all about that cash flow. Okay. Energy companies, especially those involved in oil and gas production, tend to generate a lot of cash, and returning a portion of that to shareholders through dividends is a way to keep them happy and attract more investors. It's a win-win situation. That makes sense. Okay, so we've covered two energy giants. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears a bit. I see PepsiCo on Morningstar's list. That's a company everyone knows. Are they a dividend king too? Not quite a king, but definitely an aristocrat. PepsiCo boasts a wide economic moat, meaning they have a very strong competitive advantage, and a solid 3.16% yield. Okay. Morningstar believes they're well positioned to weather any economic storms, even with people tightening their belts a bit these days. Makes sense. People always need their snacks and drinks, no matter what the economy is doing. Uh -huh. It's good to see companies like PepsiCo prioritizing dividends. It adds another layer of confidence for investors. Absolutely. Now, remember how you mentioned you were a bit hesitant about pharma? Yeah. Well, Merck, a pharmaceutical company, also made Morningstar's list. Okay. They're a dividend aristocrat with a wide moat and a yield of around 3.02%. Hmm. Pharma. I'm still a bit on the fence about that sector, but I'm willing to hear you out. Mm -hmm. What makes Merck stand out? Well, apart from their strong track record and wide moat, which suggests they have a sustainable competitive advantage in the long run, Merck is also known for its innovation in key therapeutic areas like oncology, vaccines, and hospital acute care. Okay, so they're not just resting on their laurels. They're actively developing new products and treatments. That does make them seem a bit more appealing. Exactly. And remember, this deep dive is all about exploring different options and seeing what aligns with your personal preferences and risk tolerance. Speaking of risk tolerance, there's one more company on Morningstar's list that I think we need to discuss. Altria. Altria? Isn't that a tobacco company? I thought we were steering clear of cigarettes. You are. And I completely understand your hesitation. It's crucial to invest in companies that align with your values. However, from a purely financial perspective, Altria is worth mentioning. They're a dividend king with a whopping 7.35% yield. Whoa, that's a huge yield. But why is it so high? Is that a good sign or a bad sign? It's a bit of both, actually. The tobacco industry is facing headwinds, people are smoking less, regulations are tightening, and there's growing social stigma. But Altria is still the leading tobacco maker in the U.S., and they're attempting to diversify into other areas. So that high yield could be seen as a way to attract investors who are willing to take on a bit more risk. It's like they're compensating for the uncertainty surrounding their core business. That's a fair assessment. And while Morningstar still views Altria as a solid company with a wide moat, it comes down to your personal preferences and risk tolerance. If you're uncomfortable with the ethical implications of investing in tobacco, then Altria is definitely not for you. I appreciate you being upfront about that, even though that yield is tempting. I think I'll stick to my principles and avoid tobacco stocks altogether. Are there any other companies on Morningstar's list that might be a better fit for someone like me who's looking for stability and wants to avoid ethically questionable sectors? Absolutely. Let's move on to ConocoPhillips, another energy company that made the cut. While they're not a dividend aristocrat or king, yet they have a solid track record of returning cash to shareholders with a current yield of around 2.54%. So they're more of a dividend contender, still building up their dividend-paying history but showing promise. 
Exactly. Morningstar likes their commitment to capital restraint and shareholder returns. It's a company that could be worth watching as they continue to grow and potentially move into that aristocrat or king category. It's good to have a mix of those established dividend payers yeah. and those that are still building up their track record. Diversification, right? You got it. Diversification is key to managing risk in any portfolio. And speaking of diversification, let's venture outside the energy sector for a bit. What about healthcare? Besides Merck, did any other healthcare companies catch your eye on Morningstar's list? Healthcare sounds promising. It's generally seen as a pretty stable sector, mm -hmm. right? People will always need medical care, regardless of the economy. That's a reasonable assumption. Of course, there are always risks involved, but healthcare companies tend to be more resilient during economic downturns. And on Morningstar's list, we have Medtronic, a dividend aristocrat with a yield of 3.09%. They're a major player in the medical device industry. Medtronic? I've heard of them. I'm adding them to my research list. They sound promising. Now, are there any companies on the list that are outside the realms of energy and healthcare? I'm curious to see what other sectors are represented here. You're in luck. We have Dow, a company in the chemicals industry, boasting a rather enticing 5.72% yield. Wow. Another high yield company. What's their story? Are they a dividend aristocrat or king? They're not quite in that elite group yet, but they've been consistently paying dividends for the past few years. However, they haven't been consistently increasing them for decades. Like the aristocrats in King's Morningstar sees them as undervalued and highlights their cost advantages in chemical production. So potentially another contender to keep on our radar. It's fascinating to see how diverse this list is and how many different industries are represented. It really opens up the possibilities for building a well-rounded dividend portfolio. It does. And to add to that diversity, let's not forget about Kimberly Clark. They're a classic consumer staples company. You know, the folks who make Kleenex and Huggies. Ugh, Kimberly Clark. Those are definitely household names. I bet people always need tissues and diapers no matter what the economy is doing. That makes them a good bet for stable dividends, right? Spot on. They're a dividend aristocrat with a narrow economic moat and a 3.60% yield. Morningstar expects them to continue growing their dividend at a steady pace. Okay, Kimberly Clark is definitely going on my research list. They seem like the kind of company you can buy and hold for the long haul. Any other companies we should explore before we wrap up this section? Let's finish strong with Lyondell Basil. They're in the specialty chemicals industry, and their yield is a very attractive 5.98%. Wow, that's even higher than Dow's yield. Are they a dividend aristocrat or king? Not quite, but they've been steadily increasing their dividend for the past 12 years, with an impressive average growth rate of 12.5% per year. Morningstar sees them as undervalued and points to their strong position in the polypropylene market. So they're another company that might not have the longest track record but their recent performance and dividend growth are certainly catching attention. It's incredible how many potential opportunities there are in the dividend investing world. It really is. And this deep dive into Morningstar's 10 best dividend stocks has given us a great overview of the different types of companies that prioritize returning value to their shareholders. We've seen oil and gas giants, consumer staples providers, pharmaceutical innovators, and even chemical companies, all demonstrating their commitment to dividends. It's amazing how many different paths there are to building a dividend-focused portfolio. Mm -hmm. And it really drives home the point that you don't have to sacrifice stability for growth. You can have both. Exactly. It's all about finding that sweet spot companies with solid fundamentals, a history of dividend growth, and a business model that aligns with your values and risk tolerance. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've explored different types of dividend stocks and delved into the nuances of yield versus growth, and even touched upon some of the ethical considerations involved in investing. Where do we go from here? What are your final thoughts on this whole dividend journey? It's been quite a journey, you know, exploring all these different companies and investment strategies. Yeah. And uh, what strikes me is how these dividend-focused articles offer a refreshing counterpoint to the constant hype right. surrounding, you know, high-growth, high-risk companies. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up in that. Yeah, and it's a reminder that slow and steady can win the race. Exactly. Especially when you consider the potential for market volatility right. and economic uncertainty in the years ahead. Yeah, I agree. It's easy to get caught up in the excitement of those fast-growing companies. But this deep dive has really highlighted the importance of building a solid foundation for long-term wealth creation. Yeah. And those reliable dividend payers seem like a key part of that foundation. Absolutely. Dividends can provide a sense of stability and predictability, right. especially when the market is going through turbulent times. It's mm -hmm. like having a financial cushion <laughs> yeah. soften the blow of any potential downturns. You know, one thing that really stood out to me was that 
Seeking Alpha Author's Bullish Outlook for 2025. Oh, yeah. Specifically, their belief that potential policy changes under the new Trump administration could create a more favorable environment for businesses mm -hmm. and their ability to pay dividends. It made me realize how important it is to stay informed about the broader economic and political landscape, mm -hmm. not just the individual companies we're investing in. It's a crucial point. Those macroeconomic factors can have a ripple effect throughout the market, yeah. influencing everything from interest rates and inflation to corporate profits and investor sentiment. Right. A savvy investor keeps their finger on the pulse of those trends, right. anticipating how they might impact their portfolio. It's a lot to keep track of, but I'm starting to see how it all ties together, understanding different investment categories, analyzing company fundamentals, assessing dividend yields and growth potential, and even factoring in those broader economic and political forces. It's like putting together a giant puzzle where each piece plays a vital role in creating the complete picture. That's a great analogy. And remember, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to investing. Right. What works for one person might not work for another. It all comes down to your individual goals, risk tolerance, and personal values. This deep dive has definitely equipped me with the knowledge and tools I need to start building my own dividend-focused portfolio. I feel much more confident about navigating the complex world of investing and making informed decisions that align with my long-term vision. That's what we're here for, to empower you with the information and insights you need to take control of your financial future. Yeah. And remember, this is a journey, not a destination. Keep learning, keep exploring, and keep those dividends flowing. I'm excited to embark on this journey. Thanks for being such a fantastic guide. The pleasure was all mine. That wraps up this commentary. I hope this is food for thought for you. It has been our observation that most people don't have the discipline to buy and hold stocks for the long term. We are hoping to convince you that a diversified portfolio will generate a lifetime of income if you can resist spending it. So thanks for watching. Be well. Remember, like us if you like us and subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when something new is posted. Thanks. Be well and prosper. Wherever I